Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to be together in God's house this morning. It's good to see all of God's people here this morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Yes. Better yet, are you glad to be a child of the King? Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in His care. And that's what we want to talk about here today, to rest in Him. To rest in His assurance. Praise the Lord. Just for a few moments, I'd like to go to Hebrews chapter 4. I won't be overly long. I could go a lot of different directions here today and some things that I would like to say. I just want to preface what I'm about to say. When we speak of rest in regard to God's Word, we're not talking about inactivity. Amen. We're not talking about doing nothing. You know, for most of us, when we get home from the work day, we just want to kick back and relax a little bit, right? Amen. You know, in some ways, I believe that's a misconception for us in regard to our Sunday meetings. You know, it's just the time, well, I'm just going to kick back and relax. And it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But what we're going to talk about here, what's spoken of here in Hebrews, is not talking about inactivity. Yeah. It has nothing to do with slowing down. That's right. We don't want that rocking chair mentality. We're talking about being faithful to the call. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4. Main focus is going to be verse 9. Hebrews 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come up short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not prompt them, not being mixed with faith in those things who heard it, in those who heard it. For we who have believed do not enter that rest, as he said. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Speaking of another type of rest. Although the words were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not have afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word here today. When God's word invites us to rest in God, it invites us to a particular way of assembling ourselves that would resemble a rest in God's care. Amen. Yeah, that's why that picture and that stained glass window in North Middleton Church when I was not very old stuck with me. You might say, well, why is that so important? Again, as a child growing up, hearing those Sunday school stories and being able to connect some way, that picture, that stained glass window represented to me a peace and a comfort and contentment that most of us don't have today. Your world is definitely in a struggle. There's a lot of turmoil. How do you find safety? How do you find peace? How do you find rest in a time such as we are living today? The Bible does tell us that God rested in the seventh day. But does that mean God was inactive? Does that mean he did nothing? 
Does that mean he sat by the wayside and now watched all that he had created and said, boy, this is going to be good. Have you ever done any fence building? Has anyone ever built a fence? What typically do you have to do to build a fence? What, what kind of things? What's the process? Dig a hole. You <laughs> who does that, George? <laughs> It's a process, right? You know, you just don't dig the hole and the post jump in, right? You, it's a step-by-step -step process. You dig the hole, you place the post. As Joel said, you concrete thing. You, you do the kind of things that you want the fence to last a while. But after the post is set, all secure, it's not done yet, right? You just can't sit down and say, wow, what a job I did. <laughs> But, let me ask you a question. After digging the hole, after placing the post, after placing the concrete, making sure everything's plumbed up, <coughs> you take a break? That's how hard it was. <laughs> <laughs> there is a time of resting that needs to happen. But the job's not done. You know, we set out in our Christian relationship with our Lord, and we've committed ourselves to Him, and it's a process. Yes. Things are unfolding before us. The job is ongoing. And as we move forward, we may pause for a time to rest, but we need to get up and get moving again. God ceased from His creative work on the seventh day. But in no means did he stop and did not. His divine will and his purpose was in motion. Jesus himself was very specific about this thing. He says in John 5, 7, My Father has been working until now. Jesus speaking of his heavenly Father. And I have been working. We know if we've studied the Gospels, if we studied the life of Jesus, we know that he worked. But we also know that he rested every now and then from this work. Thank you, Jesus. To understand that very idea, it involves our connecting in that relationship with our Lord. We must first remember how sin entered into the world. It all began in the garden. It all began through Adam and Eve. It happened. And God said, you will earn your way, right? Yes. You know, if you think back on the pre-sin way of life, well, you couldn't have asked for anything any more perfect. Yes. Everything that man or humankind needed at that time was there. Perfect environment. People live long lives. Yeah, I say this every now and again. How would you like to live to be 900? But today, we now live under that sin curse. We now live under a death threat, if you will. People toil. If I may say, people sweat. We did yesterday, didn't we, Zach? But in that relationship with their Lord, as we begin to labor, as we continue and stay the course, there is a promise and a blessing comes through that. Your Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 talks about becoming what is described as a new person. Where you say, how can I work, work, work and become a new person? You know, there's a saying. 
I think it was Confucius, the Confucius maybe said this, find a job that you love and you will never work a day in your life. <laughs> How many believe that? Have you ever had a job that you really loved and you didn't see the labor in? Living in the midst of sin's curse, humankind, we can hear the good news of the Bible, the good news from our Lord today. The good news that those in sin do not have to remain in sin. That we can accept that which our Lord has provided for us by way of the cross and have eternal hope. In that, when we receive Jesus Christ, if I may go as far as to say, the Bible teaches us that death ceases. Hmm. You say, well, that's not true. People are still dying. Physically, yes. You may not live to 900. Don't want to burst your bubble. But spiritually speaking, if you're a child of the king, you have hope. Amen. You have eternal hope. Amen. This provides an opportunity in life that we can step out of what seems to be a labor and becomes more of a labor of love. Why do you do what you do today in regard to your relationship with Christ? Why do you do it? Do you love the Lord today? Is your life better today, spiritually speaking, than it was yesterday or last year or 10 years ago? Are we still in that fence building mode? Moving through the process of things to complete the job. It's not done yet. We're still moving forward. That's what we're seeing here highlighted to us in this chapter we're talking about here, chapter 4, especially verse 9. The fact that we have a rest that's promised to us. To give us hope. You know, there's, there's a couple of different scriptures we could go to right now. Obviously, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 9, verse 10, uh, chapter 14. Uh, there's, there's various verses where we can go where it talks about the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. You know, chapter 1, verse 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Yes. Chapter 9, verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The point I want to make is when we walk in this relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ before God today, the fear of the Lord helps shield us. It shields us from fear. Yes. What is the biggest fear we have today? What is the greatest fear? I already heard it. What is it? Death. Death. Why? It is unknown to us. You know, if we know something, I mean, for George and working and Taylor working on automobiles, they know automobiles. So when a car comes through the door, a vehicle comes through the door, yeah, this is coming with a particular problem, and they work through the process to do that. But death is not something that any one of us has experienced and we can stand here and talk about, right? <laughs> So the unknown brings fear into our lives. But it happens in everyday life. The things that we read in God's word are things that help us emphasize God's protection over us. So we need not fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In fact, I just want to back up here for a moment. Here's Find it here. 
clear. Bear with me a moment. Psalms 14. Psalm 14. Verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominated, an abominable work. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any who understand or seek God. They have all turned aside. They have altogether become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity so knowledge, or no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call the Lord, they need to be in great fear. They need to be in great fear. If we are walking with the Lord today, we don't have to fear. But if you turn against God's creation, God's people, you need to fear. God has provided the rest that we need in those difficult times through his assurance that I'm with you. Even Jesus told his disciples not to be fearful, not to be worried. I will be with you. How long? Until the end of the age. I will be with you always. What is the recipe for walking through this journey of life, laboring in love, working for the kingdom, but being able to rest? What's the recipe? God's recipe for life makes faith the basic ingredient. Faith is the basic ingredient. Omit faith from the mixture of life. Anybody who does any baking, if you forget something. <laughs> Apparently we got something. <laughs> Cindy does that every now and then. She say, oh, I forgot this. You know, faith is not a requirement to enter real life, is it? You know, there's a new life coming here soon. It is a commitment that two people have made together, and it brings forth life. But that life, in turn, for spiritual life to happen, is a decision, a choice Amen. that those individuals make. So faith is not a requirement for the entrance into real life. But for us to enter, I'll be careful when I say this, for us to enter real life, yes. we must choose Jesus. Yes. You know, if we were to look at maybe what some describe as a literal translation of Hebrews 4.3, <laughs> The ones believing, the ones believing enter yes. real life. Yes. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be what? Saved. saved. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. God created everything and rested. We could say, as we look at God's word today, New Testament, more so. The very work of finishing the kingdom, and I'll be careful again, is left to us. The spiritual kingdom that our Lord is trying to build. God created everything and rested. We enter into a relationship with God through Christ that we might continue this work. 
Jesus told his followers again when he was about ready to leave, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I will provide one, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to come in alongside that you might finish the work. To enter into a restful relationship, we must have faith in Christ. Yes. We must be willing to keep our focus upon him. Therefore, we are entering a divine activity. We are entering into that labor of love because we love the Lord in that spiritual relationship. It is no longer a labor, but a joy. Yes. Do you enjoy what you're doing today for the Lord? You know, I've said so many times, for me, coming here is almost a vacation. You may say, that's crazy. But it's not. I enjoy the things of God. I enjoy being with God's people. And that's what it's all about. Resting in God has an appointed time. You know, we can look at verses 6 and 7 again, or 7 through 9, actually, and we can see what God's offering to us. Have you ever had someone, maybe you have said this, boy, today was a good day. Everything went well. Have you ever had a bad day? <laughs> Do you have more bad days than good days? Sometimes it seems that way, doesn't it? God's offering us good days. You may say, well, I'm not sure God fully understands the job that I do. <laughs> How do we live our day or days? How do we live that? How do we live that? One day at a time. That's all we can do, right? You can only live one day at a time. You can't live tomorrow, and you can't relive yesterday, but you can live today. Are we promised tomorrows? No, we're not. But hopefully, in this process of things, we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and tomorrow is in his care. I know who holds tomorrow as we sing this song. I know he has me in his care. The writer of Hebrews seems to be excited to help us realize what he's provided for us. What's it mean? Verses 7 through 9. God again has set a certain day, calling it today. <coughs> when a long time later he spoke through David as was said before, today, if you hear his voice, don't let it burn your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. You know, we have the promise of a perfect day of rest. But while we are yet here in this life, we are to be living, laboring, and resting. Amen. The writer still of Hebrews reminds us again that following the time of Joshua, God was still speaking through David. God is still speaking through his people today. God is still making good use of the time in this creative work that is ongoing. Now, I'm not talking about the heavens and the earth. I'm talking about the spiritual creation of God's most prized creation, his people. It's important for us. I want to share something here briefly in the way of a story. And we're going to close. 
You know, a number of years ago, in the Daily Bread, there was a story. And this story is basically entitled, The War is Over. The bitter conflict had finally ended between the North and the South, 1865. The soldiers of the U.S. Civil War were free to return to their families. But a number of them remained in the woods, living on berries. They either didn't hear or didn't believe that the war was over. So they continued enduring miserable conditions when they could have been back home. It's something like that in our spiritual realms. Christ made peace between God and man by dying in our place. He paid sin's penalty on the cross. Anyone who accepts his sacrifice will be forgiven by a holy God. Sadly, today, many people refuse to believe. Many today dismiss the gospel. They continue to live life as spiritual fugitives. Sometimes even those who have placed their trust in Christ live on almost at the same level they were at before. Sad, sad picture. Either out of ignorance or unwillingness, they fail to claim the promise. They do not experience the joy. They do not experience the assurance that should accompany our salvation. They do not draw from the relationship with God and the comfort and the peace that he intends for all of his children. They are the objects of his love, care, provision, but live as orphans. Question this. Have you been living apart from God? Have you been missing his comfort, his love, his reassurance? Can you place yourself in the arms of your Lord being nurtured and cared for? You know, we fail our Lord if we fail to realize what he's provided for us. We fail our Lord if we are not living in the fullness of all that he has done for us. So what needs to happen? Well, we need to reach out in prayer to our Lord. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit will help us realize what we have been given. What has come through that finished work on Calvary? We need to grasp this spiritual energy that comes through the Holy Spirit. And we need to claim it in triumph. God has done it for us. Christ has provided a victory that we all need to have. I'm going to share one more story right around the same time period because it deals with a choice, a choice that all of us need to make. And sometimes we don't understand the whys of life, but God has a perfect plan. You might say this might come back and somewhat connect with Hebrews 2, Hebrews 4, chapter or verse 2. And it's called The Choice. And again, it is another Daily Bread story. And it basically comes out of the same time period that I've just read from, the 1860s. We've all heard the infamous name, a man by the name of John Willis Booth. He's the man who assassinated President Lincoln in 1865. But how many of us have ever heard of Edwin Booth? Edwin Booth was John's oldest brother. Edwin was a well-known actor, and he was waiting at a Jersey City train station when he saw someone slip and fall onto the off the platform. 
Edwin quickly grabbed the man's collar and pulled him up to safety, rescuing him from serious injury or possibly death. Who was the man he saved? Who was the man that Edwin Booth saved? It was Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert, a soldier in the Civil War. You have John Willicks Booth responsible for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. But you have John's brother, Edwin, saving the life of Abraham Lincoln's son. How ironic are these kind of things? How does these things seem to happen? How do we explain these away? One man killing, the other man saving. The Lord has given us a choice, does he not? <laughs> if someone offers you one of two things, one of them being life, another one being death, what would you choose? Is there anyone in here who would choose death? The choice that we make determines our eternal destination. Do you believe that? Eternity is determined by the choice that we make. One leads to everlasting life. The other leads to condemnation and separation from God. Now, as I said earlier, we have no control over tomorrow. But let me say this in closing. The choice that you make or the choice that you have made will determine your tomorrow. Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. Have you chose Jesus as Lord of your life? Do you know him in a personal way today? Have you made the right choice? Are you living, loving, laboring, and resting at the same time? Is it possible? Let's stand together. Lord, there is none like you. There is none in heaven or earth now, Lord, like you. Lord, you have given so much. You have given us hope. Lord, just like the story, if we choose life eternal with you, the war is over. The battle is won. Lord, you have given us the victory. And we can rest in the assurance, Lord, of the tomorrow that you've promised. Lord, just help us to keep our focus. Help us to be that example to those around us. Help us, Lord, to be there to care for those who are in need today. The less fortunate, the widows, the widowers, those orphans of today the spiritual orphans today, Lord. Yes. May we have that bread of life to share with them. May we have that water from the rock to help quench their thirst. Lord, you have given us all things. And Lord, all things are in your time. And Lord, may we be in time with you. Yeah. Lord, bless this people today. May we go forth into this week ahead. May we be energized. May we truly walk as you have called us to. Being a mirror, being a light, being a glimmer of hope in sometimes what can be described as a very dismal world. Lord, touch lives today through the words of encouragement, the love that is shared, the time that is spent. 
And Lord, I pray that your kingdom, your kingdom will come. And Lord, we will be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. In your most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.